What's going on guys? Welcome to a brand new adventure. For the first time ever, you're going to be playing somebody real. Somebody who has actually existed. And you're gonna have to succeed in a very difficult quest. Your character is Enmerkar, a level 70 king priest from the Sumerian civilization. Let's now take a look at your stats. Of course, it should really be no surprise that your magic is maxed out. That covers the priest part of your class. But you're also a king, and to be a good king, you must have a lot of intelligence. Combine both, and you have a highly intellectual priest who's very knowledgeable in magic and religion, as well as in how to rule a kingdom. The setting for this whole adventure is ancient Mesopotamia. We're talking somewhere around the year 2900 BC. Now to put this in perspective, that's like right about when the Egyptian civilization came to existence. There were no pyramids, no empires, and only but a few cities and villages scattered throughout the territory. This was right at the cradle of civilization. You're the king of one of history's earliest civilizations, but king isn't really the appropriate word because I mean the concept of a kingdom or a king really did not exist back then. Instead, you can think of it more like a leader, and since in those times a life without God wasn't really something you would think about, the leaders were usually priests. Your civilization, Sumer, is arguably the very first one in the world, contested only by the Hindus and maybe the Egyptians. It was in and around ancient Mesopotamia that we started seeing the very first urban centers around the year 4000 BC. But this was like very early in history, and most cities did not have more than 10,000 inhabitants. You're the leader of a city called Uruk, located right on the Euphrates River. At this current time, this was the biggest city in the entire world. Like your local census has estimated that there's about 50 to 80,000 people living in a small 6 km squared walled village. It was also the same city that the famous Sumerian king Gilgamesh was going to rule in about 200 years. During that time, leadership was passed down from father to son, as was the case pretty much everywhere. You became the ruler when your father mysteriously vanished while on a trip to the sea somewhere in the west. People say that he was looking for something and never came back. Once it was clear that he wasn't going to return, you ascended to the throne, so to speak, because it wasn't really a throne, and you became the ruler of Uruk. And then you dedicated the next years of your life to making it the biggest and most influential city in the ancient world. Because look, something was going on in the ancient world at the time, a sort of movement. We saw a large shift from agricultural villages to larger urban centers. That's what we call the creation of civilizations. And Uruk actually became the leading influence of that movement and was setting the example for other smaller villages. Now of course, to support this movement, a lot of trade routes had to be set up. Trade supports growth and without it, growth can't really happen. But since most of your neighboring cities were close by or further up one of the rivers in Mesopotamia, this wasn't such a hard thing to do. Being a priest, you spend a lot of your time in the main temple of the city, the temple that you yourself had commissioned for the goddess Inanna, one of the main deities of the Sumerian and later Babylonian religions. Offering a powerful deity a temple like this one was one of the best ways to assure your success and your prosperity. You're currently in the temple and you're praying to Inanna for good things to happen. I mean, this is something that you do every single day and you're convinced that this is the reason why things are so good right now. You've probably pleased her enough for her to bless you and your people for the many years to come. As you're praying, you suddenly get this weird feeling in your stomach. Kind of like an emotion, but not really. You feel something is calling you, trying to communicate. As you're trying to figure out what it is and what you're feeling, you find yourself unable to stand up and you fall to the floor. Your first thought is that you're dying, but this doesn't feel like death. In fact, this doesn't feel like anything you've ever felt before. And then you see something, something in the distance a ship. There's water all around you and there's that ship over there. It looks like one of your own trading ships. As you inspect the distant ship, your pain suddenly has gone, or at least you don't feel it anymore. But then you notice that there's a man on the ship. Just one man, all alone. He looks like, like a king priest. He sort of looks like you. As you're trying to figure out who this man is, he suddenly jumps into the water and vanishes from sight. You try to look for him, but there's nothing. He's gone. Then, as you're looking, you find yourself back in the temple on the floor where you fell down just a moment ago. Did you just have a vision? You ask yourself, 
was one of your own trading ships? Was that what you were seeing? Who was that man? Like he looked like a king priest. Was that you? And of course, why did he jump in the water? One of your high priests comes in and sees you on the floor. He heard a noise and thought something might have happened to you. Are you all right? He says, what's going on? You get up, come to your senses and tell the man what you've just seen. As you're explaining, you notice that you have something on your hand, what looks to be some form of writing. But this wasn't hieroglyphs or anything like that. Nothing you can truly understand, just a bunch of lines. As you notice it, the priest immediately speaks and says that your name is written on your hand. What? How does he know? You ask. How do I know what? The priest replies. What do you mean, what? You show him your hand and tell him how does he know that this says your name? The priest doesn't seem to know what you're talking about. Did he just have some sort of vision as well? You really don't understand what's going on. But I mean, if this writing really has your name on it, then maybe it was you that you were seeing in the vision. You have, of course, many questions. Like, why were you on a boat in the middle of nowhere? And why did you jump? What happened next? You figure that the only real option that you have right now is to continue praying. I mean, since your vision happened as you were praying, you assume that this may have been a gift from Inanna and maybe if you pray again, she'll give you another hint as to what you have to do, if anything at all. I mean, who knows what this whole thing is about? You dismiss the priest and you start praying. As you're doing that, a young boy enters the temple and comes to see you. You look at him and notice that he's barely 10 years old. He looks poor. Not a slave, but pretty close. How did he get in the temple? There's no way that this little kid could have slipped through the guards. Once you fully notice and acknowledge the boy, he looks at you and tells you that it's time. You have been given a second chance in this cycle. He tells you that there's a ship waiting for you on the river. Get on it and sail west. Don't stop until you get there. You'll know, he says. And then the boy just gets up and runs away outside the temple. You run after him only to find the guards at the entrance. You ask them about the boy, why they didn't stop him, and they reply that they didn't see any boy. Like there's been nobody here but them. Okay, this is weird. Like you just saw him and he definitely spoke to you. You go to the river that the boy told you to go to and you see a ship. A single ship at the docks. And it looks exactly like the ship that you saw in your vision. You ask the worker who the ship belongs to and how long it's been there for. He replies that he has absolutely no clue. There's no records of it coming here and there's no records of who it might belong to. Okay, that's also weird. But I mean, at least he sees it too, right? You take a moment to fully realize what's going on and what you're about to do. Are you seriously going to venture out into the West without any sort of clue as to where you're going or why you have to go there? But then again, how can you not? I mean, you clearly had the vision, the priest deciphered the writing on your hand, and this boy told you explicitly that you had to sail west. I mean, what if this has something to do with your father? After all, he sailed west before he disappeared. What if you could finally understand what happened to him? There's like no real choice here. You kind of, you have to go. At this point, you decide to really keep quiet and not involve many people in this decision. You go back quickly to your temple, you get some essentials for your journey, head back to the docks, and you tell the dock worker that you're going west and that you're looking for something and that you have to go alone. You then take one last look at your city, the magnificent city that you've just built, and then you get on the boat to start sailing. You've now been on the water for quite some time now. Luckily for you, the world technology had advanced to the point where you now had sailboats. Congratulations. I mean, they were essential for trade and growth of your cities. So yeah, like you were lucky. A couple of thousand years earlier and you would have had a totally different experience. The boat that you were currently on was essentially pretty primitive in its design. It was essentially a sailboat, but you only had one square piece of cloth that you would use as your sail. And the rest of the boat was made from wood. So you can kind of imagine the difficulties of using that as a means of transport. For one, you couldn't really change the direction of your sails. I mean, if the wind blew in the general direction that you wanted to go in, then things went well. If not, then things did not go so well and you literally had to wait until the wind changed direction. 
Not only that, but the quality of the boat itself wasn't necessarily the best either. I mean, does this really surprise you? This was the year 2900 BC. It was good enough to transport some people and some goods from one city to the next, but that's all that it was really good for. It could literally break at any time, especially on such a long journey. You had brought with you some food and some essentials for your trip, but you had no idea for how long you were supposed to travel for, nor where you were going. All that you knew was that you had to sail west, and you were not to stop until, well, you don't know. Now, if you take a look at the map, going west from Mesopotamia had to be done through the Mediterranean Sea. It's pretty much a straight line from here to there. Then, right above North Africa and Southern Spain was a place called the Pillars of Heracles. In fact, it wasn't called that yet, but in a few thousand years it will be. This was the furthest point to the west in the European continent. Beyond that was the Atlantic Ocean, and well to you, at this current time, the edge of the world. And to keep yourself safe throughout this journey, as a smart king priest, you decide to sail along the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. That way, if anything bad were to happen, you could potentially just get back to safety. I mean, it would be a little bit easier. But the Mediterranean only goes so far. At some point, you're going to reach the Atlantic Ocean, and then, well, who knows what's going to happen to you. That was a place where very few people had ventured to before at this time. Maybe your father was one of those people. You have absolutely no idea. The only real guidance you have was that boy that told you that you'll know. But I mean, you'll know what? Like you've been sailing for months now, and there's been nothing. You just passed the Pillars of Heracles a few days ago when you suddenly notice something is different. There's no more wind. The water around you has become completely calm. There's not one wave anywhere in sight. How long have you been stationary like this? You don't know you weren't particularly paying attention to the wind, even though you really should have. You look past the edge of the boat downward and have to do sort of a double take because you think you just saw a light at the bottom of the sea. You take a second look and see that indeed, there's a light. And then it suddenly hits you. It all makes sense. The ship, you being alone on it, and you looking out onto the water, that's exactly what you saw in your vision. That's what you were looking at. It wasn't your father on the boat. It was you. And then you remember what happened next. You jumped. You look around you, you look down at the light and think to yourself, Am I really going to do this? I guess so. You muster up the courage and you dive straight in. As soon as you touch the water, it pulls you down with tremendous force and you start to panic. But not for long because you realize that you're able to breathe. I mean, you're underwater, but you're able to breathe normally. You're still being pulled down very fast, though. As you're sinking, the light above you from the sun is disappearing very fast while the light below you is increasing in intensity. You're going towards something, something very big. Finally, you reach the bottom, the ocean floor. You have no idea how deep you are, but you know that you're very far away from home. How are you ever going to get back? There's nothing around you but a simple gate, a gate made of gold and it's shining bright. This was the light that you were seeing, and it looks like it's guarding something. As you approach the gate, you see what appears to be a massive entrance that's locked. You can't tell what's behind the entrance, but you see an inscription right on the gate. It's written in a weird form of writing, the same one that's on your hand right now. Well, that was on your hand because it's now gone. You look at the inscription, and even though you've never seen something like this before besides on your hand, you can understand it. You can read it. And this is what it reads. The gates are to protect the elements. They have corrupted man, and thus have been taken away from him. Far from him, they have been kept until the cycle is to come anew and the pattern reset. What? What could that mean? What elements? What cycle? What's being kept from man? You then see more text below. It reads, I have only one color, but many shapes. I appear and disappear, but always exist. The sun is my enemy, but with the rain, I am friendly. I alone can do no harm, but can also feel no pain. What am I? You then see four images on the gate. You assume that you're supposed to do something with one of them. Maybe there's a choice to be made. You see that the images are now glowing in gold, and so is your hand. 
you figure that you have to touch the image with your hand and you have to touch the right one. The problem is, which one do you choose? You look and you can make up all four images, like they're very, very clear. And here they are in order. There's fire, there's a shadow, there's a cloud, and there's water. So, which one do you choose? All right, guys, you now have like 24 hours to vote, after which I will release the next part of this quest. Choose wisely, work together, and be careful, because this choice actually matters, and if you fail, there's a real chance that you may not see where this story is going to go. You'll have to wait for the next cycle to return, and who knows when that will be. Thank you so much for watching, for coming on this journey. My name has been Darius Kozin, and I will see you all tomorrow with hopefully the right choice. Good luck, guys.